It's December 2000. Three Doors Down just gave us kryptonite. If I go crazy, then will you still call me Superman? And Destiny's Child asked us to say my name, say my name. No one is around you. The Rams have won the Super Bowl for the first time since 1951, and X-Men the movie is released, showing Hollywood that big-budget superhero films can be real cash cows. Y2K has come and gone without causing the world to collapse, though September of the next year would seem to do so, at least for us Americans. But in that short period, we were in a sort of liminal space, a blissful innocence riding off the Clinton era. It was a new millennia, filled with new possibilities, and a recently turned 11-year-old Meromorphic. It's December 2000, and I'm with my father on our weekly trip to eat at Boston Market and then to either peruse the books at Barnes & Noble or the electronic toys at Fry's. We chose Fry's that week, first performing our ritual of checking what the largest hard drive was on sale. The capacities had been booming at the time. It seemed like it doubled every time we went in. 10 gigabytes, 20, 50. But this day was special. On this day, I found a game for my brand new PlayStation that my parents had bought me for my birthday, Final Fantasy VIII. It was immediately intriguing because it was in a thicker package, dick joke, than the other PlayStation games. The logo looked pretty neat too, and seeing the fully rendered characters on the front was pretty awesome to 11-year-old me. Outside of that, I don't really know why I chose that game. I knew nothing about it, and I had no experience with JRPGs. Not that I even knew what that term meant. Still, I bought it, or, well, my dad did. But regardless, I was engrossed from the very first cutscene. It's March 2001. Over three months later, and I'm still playing this game and combing through every detail of the guidebook that I bought with it. The thing was rough and torn up as if from years of use, from me constantly flipping back and forth between the bestiary and weapons guides, constantly trying to eke out every little bit of an advantage to beat some of the harder optional bosses. All the while, my mother's 40th birthday party is going on in the room next door. Her friends from high school had arranged a male stripper to come, and yet I was blissfully unaware, laser focused on my video game. My mother's friends said something like, Everything is bigger in Texas? I focused harder on the game. I love you, Mom. So, I have a confession to make. I never beat the game on that first playthrough. But, but, since then I have gone back to play and complete Final Fantasy more times than any other game. I love absolutely everything about it. It has this intangible charm to me. Even the things that other people despise are some of my favorite parts. It was the first game that I had played that allowed me to completely strategize every encounter, building up my team and methodically taking down bosses. Hell, I even made an entire damn ass guide to beating one of those optional bosses, which I could have sworn I posted to GameFAQs. Where the hell are you? But it seems lost to time. I start with all this because I need you to understand how much this game means to me. And as intangible, as ethereal as its charm is, I want to finally try to translate that. There is no possible way for me to be unbiased with this game, and so I'm not even going to try to fight it. This is not a normal retrospective. This is just a love letter to the game that first got me interested in gaming, that revealed I was a bit of a weeb, and that may have awakened strange, tingly feelings for a certain character. This is a love letter to Final Fantasy VIII. Now, before we go any further, I need to make a second confession. I have never played Final Fantasy VII, at least not the original, and I may get flack for saying this, but I didn't like the remake at all, outside of the battle system. The mainline Final Fantasy games I have played are 8, 10, 12, 13, and 15, so that's my experience with the series. We good? 
Okay, good. Final Fantasy VIII was first released in 1999, and the footage you're seeing on screen is from that original release, running through an emulator. Though the developer, Square Enix, had cut their teeth in 3D graphics with 7, 8 was notable in that the people were actually people-shaped, and not just ball and stick figures. This was already pretty mind-blowing to me at the time, but even more impressive were the full motion graphic cutscenes interspersed throughout the game, which were absolutely jaw-dropping for a game in 1999, especially considering that some of them were happening in the background while you controlled the normally rendered characters. To this day, seeing those scenes sends chills up my spine. The game was the brainchild of, and I'm sure I'm gonna butcher this name, Yoshinori Kitase, who also directed many other games in the Final Fantasy series, notably 7 and 10, as well as Tetsuya Nomura, who was the character, monster, and battle system designer, and Yusuke Neoi, in charge of the FMV and backgrounds. The three built a world from the base theme of flipping Seven on its head. As Naoi said in an interview, the previous Final Fantasy game had images of light emerging from darkness. It was very beautiful, but this time we decided to turn it upside down. Shadows in light. And at this, they hit the nail on the head. Throughout the entire game, there are little hints of darkness. As you move around the garden in the first two discs, you run into these mysterious figures who slowly move more and more into the foreground, becoming these faceless symbols of authority. But whose authority? It's unclear, and right as you're really starting to question it, they cause a civil war between factions of the students. And that's just one example. The bright colors, the peppy music, and the funny character dialogue between Zell and Cypher, or the inherent silliness of Selfie being so ditzy despite being a professional mercenary, are all masks that the world of Final Fantasy VIII wears, concealing something darker. This speaks to me because it's a near perfect reflection of our world, you know, minus the magic and the monsters, and yeah. It grounds the characters in a more relatable setting than really any of the other Final Fantasy games I've played, outside of maybe 15. But whoa now, I'm getting ahead of myself. Who are Zell and Cypher and Selfie? What's a garden? What is Final Fantasy about? Well, let's do a brief synopsis. Bearing in mind that this is four discs worth of story, so brief is a relative term. Oh lord, here we go. You play as Squall, a lonely, brooding, hot boy anime man who just wants to be left to his own devices. The game begins on a cutscene showing a duel between Squall and his arch nemesis, Cypher, who gets a strike on our boy, leaving a scar between his eyes. They each carry a gun blade. It's like a gun with a blade. Completely impractical, yet totally awesome. Squall is a young mercenary in training for an organization called Seed. Seed operates throughout the world, taking on missions and training students in gardens, these giant school complexes. The game follows Squall's development as he first graduates the Seed exam by helping to liberate the nation of Dalit from the Galbadians, another nation hell-bent on world domination. Throughout the story, Squall gains companions, and the story becomes just as much theirs as it is his, each one being fleshed out dynamic characters. The first of which is Squall's instructor, Quistus, who accompanies him on a makeup exam that he missed because of the duel with Cypher. Here, Squall gets his first, or if you're attentive, third, GF. Guardian forces are basically friendly monsters that you can assign, or junction, to your characters. They can be summoned in a battle to attack the enemy, but have tons of other uses that we'll get into later. You get a bunch of these guardian forces throughout the game, either by fighting them directly or by drawing them from other enemies. Quistus is only a year older than Squall, but is clearly much wiser than he is. She sees right through Squall's brooding bad boy act and constantly shows it by literally finishing his sentences before he can. Next is Zell who can be summed up in a single word, volatile. He is extremely loyal, but press the right buttons and he flies off in a rage, which Cypher does constantly. The fourth member is Selfie, 
We first meet her on Squall's seed exam, where she joins the party after Cypher goes off by himself. Selfie is a walking contradiction. She is a mercenary in training, yet she is also clumsy and completely innocent. She's deadly, but more likely to hug you than hit you. After passing the exam, Squall and the other newly promoted seeds are treated to a celebration ball, where we meet the fifth member of Squall Team 6, Renoa. She is the main love interest in the game, and she immediately has Squall's number, just like Quistus, constantly teasing him, prying his feelings out, even if it's just an angry reaction. There's this half-hearted attempt at a love triangle here with Cypher, but it never really materializes, and it's always clear that Renoa and Squall are going to end up together, so I'm just gonna ignore it. As quickly as it began, the dance ends, and Squall is on his first seed mission to help a small resistance movement liberate the nation of Timber from Galbadian control. Galbadia just has their grubby fingers and everything. That small resistance is led by none other than Renoa. During their mission, there's this awesome FMV sequence with our characters running across a moving train, and then a section that I failed so many times as a child, I still have PTSD from it and save scum like crazy when I get there. Side note, there are a lot of trains in this game. Seriously, if that Tumblr blog rating Marvel movies by the number of trains in them did the same thing with the Final Fantasy series, 8 would be at the tippy top. Seriously, even one of the Guardian forces is a train. But the plan, which was to capture the Galbadian president, goes tits up when it's revealed that the president on the train was actually a body double monster. They defeat it, but now Galbadia is in on what's going on. It's revealed here that the reason Gbads wanted Dalit, the place you freed in the seed exam, was to get access to their communications tower. Apparently, long-range radio broadcasts haven't been a thing for nearly 20 years in this world, and so they revived the tower to send out an important message. That message was to announce the new Galbadian ambassador, the real power behind the government, the sorceress Edea and her knight, Cypher. Dun, dun. After failing to stop the broadcast and being brushed aside in their first encounter with Edea, Squall's crew are forced to flee Timber for Galbadia Garden, which is supposedly unaffiliated with the country of its namesake. There, they are immediately drafted into a mission to assassinate Sorceress Edea. It is here that we meet the final member of the squad, Irvine Kineas. He is a sniper, supposedly a lone wolf character, but is, in reality, much more outgoing than Squall and generally nicer than Zell. Their inside man in Galbadia's capital city is a high-ranking general who is revealed to be Renoa's father. Some hijinks occur. Renoa gets temporarily captured. Irvine's sniper shot is deflected by a barrier Sorceress Edea puts up at the last second, and so Squall is forced to rush in and attack her head-on. They do battle, but Edea is ultimately victorious, and before leaving, she shoots an icicle through Squall's shoulder. Cue the end of disc one. Oh, Christ, there are three more of these to cover? Okay, so Laguna from the dream sequences. Shit, I forgot to mention the dream sequences. Uh, this shit is all falling apart. So a few times throughout the game, Squall and the others randomly pass out, and they wake up as other people. Laguna, Kiros, and Ward. They aren't really controlling these people, they just witness the events and are able to read the thoughts of the people they're inhabiting. Don't worry if you're confused, that's natural. Give it about five minutes for me to explain, and if your confusion still hasn't gone down, cast Isuna. So disc two begins with the Laguna sequence. He's living in a small town called Windhill. Who is Laguna? Well, he's a retired Galbadian soldier, but a good one. He's living with a woman named Rain and a little girl named Alone, and he's helping out around the town. Remember those names. Squall and the gang eventually wake up, finding themselves in a Galbadian prison, with Squall being tortured by Cypher, asking what Seed's true purpose is. We get our first clues that the dream sequences actually happened in the past and weren't just something that they're imagining, as Zell realizes that he knows the prison layout from living inside Ward, and some of the little Moogle monsters keep saying Laguna to Squall, and even assist their escape. Cue a prison break scene, and the realization that the whole complex is made up of three giant screws that can submerge the prison underground in the middle of a desert. Fucking awesome. 
At this point, the group splits up because news has spread that the Galbadians were targeting the Gardens with missiles for their involvement in the assassination attempt on the Sorceress. As they decide what to do, missiles are already launched for Trabia Guard, Selfie's original home. Selfie goes on a mission to shut down the missile base to prevent the strikes, while Squall leads a team to Balam Garden, their home, to evacuate. Selfie is successful in destroying the base, but it appears that her team is killed in the explosion. Squall's team, on the other hand, what's that? You hear that? The plot is going off the rails! Squall returns to the garden to find it in the midst of a civil war. Apparently, there are two factions, the Headmaster Sid and Garden Master Norg. Up until now, we've never really heard of the latter, but we have seen his minions skulking about in the background, occasionally giving orders or reprimands. It turns out that Norg wants to give up Squall's crew to the Sorceress in order to gain clemency for the assassination, but that just won't do. We also learn here that the headmaster, Sid, is actually married to Idea, and that Seed was founded to fight the sorceress, should the need arise. So Squall defeats Norg and activates some mysterious machinery in the bowels of the garden, and holy fucking crap, the garden is a giant ship. The garden is a giant fucking ship. My 11-year-old brain broke at this point when I first played the game. So awesome. The ship gains mobility and a disaster is averted. In the middle of all the action between Sid and Norg, a mysterious ship appears to whisk away a girl named Lone. Remember that name? Well, she was also the one who checked on Squall at the beginning of the game. She reveals that she was the one sending the gang into the dream world, though we don't learn everything at this point. Without navigation, however, the garden eventually drifts into a floating town out in the ocean, nearly crushing a fisherman and the rest of its inhabitants. Here too, Galbadia is invading, trying to find Elone for some reason. After a boss battle, it's revealed that Selfie's team survived the missile base explosion, and the screw, that's Squall's crew, is reunited. As the ship is prepared, the screw Okay, I'm done using that term. Squall's crew set up a concert to cheer up their leader, and Squall and Renoa get some alone time. And we get this awesome concert scene. So once the garden is pilotable, the gang visits Trabia Garden, Selfie's original school, only to find it devastated by the Galbadian missiles. Fortunately, there were survivors, and it is here on the basketball courts where the story breaks wide open. Irvine recalls his time living in an orphanage as a child with other kids and a woman named Matrone. Quickly, the others all realize that, except for Renoa, they were all living in that same orphanage, and that Matrone was their name for Idea, the orphanage mother. The reason that none of them remembered up until this trigger was due to the Guardian Forces, or GFs. Apparently, junctioning them takes up a spot in the brain linked to memories and so the more they are junctioned, the more memories are lost. Memories, history lost for power. Interesting concept. It was never mentioned before this point as being a possibility, but sure, we'll roll with it. After the epiphany, the team decides to visit the orphanage, but are thwarted by the also mobile Galbadia Garden. It's a ship too. A standoff begins above the forest on the Sintra continent between two floating behemoths. A huge battle between the mobile gardens ensues, and Squall and Renoa take the fight to Galbadia Garden and face off with Sorceress Idea and Cypher for a second time. This time, though, they are victorious. Idea is defeated and suddenly has an abrupt personality change. Odd that. Meanwhile, Renoa is in a trance. She moves around like a puppet revives Cypher, and then goes into a coma. Weird. Thus ends Disc 2. Okay, let's pick up the pace a bit. Disc 3 is centered around finding a way to revive Renoa. Another major plot point is revealed here, probably the biggest one. Idea was not acting on her own accord, but was in fact being possessed by another sorceress from the future, Ultimessia, the ultimate big bad of the game. Idea tells Squall that Elone may be able to help Renoa wake up, but upon finding the ship that she escaped on, Squall finds out that Elone escaped on another ship bound for the nation of Esthar. Yes, you heard that right. She left Balam Garden, which was at the time a ship, 
to hide on the White Seed ship, and then left that ship to jump on an Eth Star ship. So Squall decides to set out on his own, carrying Renoa on his back to find Elone in Ethsar. Estar. Estar. To find Elone in Estar. Though, of course, the rest of the group can't be separated so easily. They intercept and join him on the way. And it's quite touching, because they really have built up this friendship over the course of the game. Estar is a hidden country once ruled by another evil sorceress named Adele. Not that one though Laguna helped capture and imprison her. Up until this point, it's also been completely inaccessible as the continent is ringed by cliffs on all sides, and so you just couldn't get the garden up there because it needs a beach. But also, the city is ringed by an active camouflage protective barrier, and it's completely invisible from the outside. Still, the crew find a way in. There, Dr. Odine, this guy, agrees to help them, and sends up Squall and Renoa to a lunar base to finally reunite with Elone. Unfortunately, this was all part of Ultimesia's plan. She had switched bodies in Disc 2 from Edea to Renoa in that last fight, and once again takes control of Renoa in the lunar base to release the seals on Sorceress Adele's prison. Adele was so powerful that their combined power, Adele and Ultimesia, would be nigh unstoppable. This is all coinciding with an event called the Lunar Cry, which isn't super relevant to the plot, but is really cool nonetheless. There's this really weird giant floating obelisk called the Lunatic Pandora or the Lunatic Pandora, not sure. And when it floats over a spot called Tears Point, all this shit lights up and a funnel from the moon to the earth is formed, allowing monsters to come to the earth in like a giant wave. Yeah. Apparently, all the monsters on Earth came from the moon in events like these. So, who the fuck made this thing and why? Anyways, Adele is released from her prison and gets caught in the monster wave, crashing down inside the lunatic Pandora. In order to release Adele, Renoa, possessed by the spirit of Michael Jackson, did a moonwalk trance outside the lunar base to the prison in space. When it was done, she was knocked into the void and was quickly running out of oxygen. Meanwhile, the base is breaking apart and everyone has to evacuate into pods. Squad, having walked across a continent to save Renoa, wasn't about to let that fly, however, and so he dives into space after her. The two are saved by a literal deus ex machina in the form of a Ragnarok ship, an abandoned Esthar vessel that just happened to float by. After clearing the ship of its Ridley Scott-inspired inhabitants, the two begin to make their way back to Earth, sharing a tender moment in the pilot seat. It wasn't meant to last, though, because the Esthar Air Control informs them that Renoa, being a sorceress now, will be taken into custody on their landing and sealed so that Ultimesia cannot take control of her again. For the time being, Renoa and Squall accept this fate for her, but after letting her go and then talking to the rest of the team, Squall decides, to hell with that, we're getting our girl back. And they do. They just get her back, literally just like that. It's honestly kind of weird how fast and quick about the turnabout is, but ultimately, after talking with Laguna, who is now the president of Esthar, apparently, they learn that Ultimesia is trying to compress time so that she can rule in the past, present, and future. And she wants to do so using Elone. The group forms an admittedly opaque plan wherein they kill Adele and force Ultimesia to possess Renoa, being the only other sorceress of the time. Elone then partially compresses time, halting it from doing so completely, I think, and sends Ultimesia back to her future castle where the gang is hot on her heels. Because Elone has this like time compression power, she can send consciousness back as past. Yeah. After fighting their way through Ultimesia's castle, they finally confront the sorceress, and a grueling battle ensues, including Ultimesia's GF, Griever, which is the name Squall gave to his necklace pendant. I never really got this part, but according to the wiki, Griever is not only a symbol of the virtue Squall values, but is also Squall's interpretation of the ultimate guardian force. During the final battle, Ultimesia draws Griever from Squall's mind, bringing Squall's perception of the being into existence to fight the party. Apparently, this is made more explicit in the Japanese version, though, so either way, they ultimately defeat Ultimesia. 
Finally victorious, the group are scattered across time, walking in a void with only their connections between one another as a guide to reinstate themselves in their proper times. We see Laguna at Rain's grave, alone going to meet him and Squall looking on. We see a dying Ultimesia passing on her powers in the past to a young Idea, and finally we see Squall, lost and alone, passed out, possibly dead, finally found by Renoa. The final scene shows a celebration at Balam Garden, with Renoa on the balcony, and in the final moments, we see Squall embrace her. Apparently, he lived. Cut to Black, directed by Neil Druckmann. So, what did all this mean? The story, while all over the place at times, does successfully, in my opinion, tackle a lot of different topics. That's one thing I love about this game. The other is that humanity is dripping from every character. There's so much pathos and love between all of them by the end that you can't help but root for them to succeed and to do so together. So many nice details and themes, so much to discuss. So I think I'll just point out some of the greatest hits. Like Squall learning to accept that he needs others, he was alone as a child, feeling abandoned by alone, and so put up walls around himself. Only through his friends, and importantly not just Renoa, but all of them, was he finally able to do so. His story ends as it begins, where at first he was alone and afraid, being abandoned, as he thought, by his sister. And at the end, he is alone and afraid. Only this time, he is saved by Renoa, who refused to abandon him. This is his main character arc, and it's expressed perfectly through his actions, and even through gameplay. Every natural point where characters express their feelings, Squall goes quiet. He is also the most self-sufficient character in the game, having the highest base attack and hit percent stats. In other words, the game is telling you that he is a loner, though obviously he can't do everything on his own. Then there's Renoa. In a super relatable way, for me especially, she feels this imposter syndrome creep up throughout the game. In the beginning, she is this super spunky, super confident rebel planning to capture a president of an invading nation. But as time goes on and the events get larger and larger in scope, she sees herself less as that rebel and more as the only non-seed in the group. She feels like she holds them back, despite the actual gameplay showing us that she holds her own just as well as the others. This is so clear to the player that when she says it, our natural reaction is, say, what? I'm just a little confused. But that is good because imposter syndrome really doesn't make logical sense. And in the end, she accepts her role as both a member of Squall Team 6 and a sorceress, helping in a big way to take down the big bad. Or even smaller details, like in the end, when Ultimesia goes to the past and passes on her powers to Idea. Squall watches on and even talks to Idea there, telling her that he is a seed, destined to fight the sorceress, Idea not knowing what the hell he's talking about. So then, later on, Idea creates Seed and Garden together with Sid, which trains Squall to fight the sorceress, eventually going back to tell Idea who creates Seed and Garden together, time travel is fucky, and it's a nice nod from the writers. Or the fact that Squall is clearly Laguna and Rain's kid. The game never really explicitly says it, but it can be gleaned from little dialogue about Rain dying in childbirth while Laguna is off to find alone, or the Moogles calling Squall Laguna. Rain dying and Laguna being off would have left Squall as an orphan, which is why he was sent to live with Matrone and the others. I mean, I guess that one's more like a fact than it is an awesome story point, but it is a fun fact nonetheless. There's just so much to love, so much to unpack with this story and its characters. The female characters, holy cow. They made young me realize that playing as a girl in a game was okay and even cool. That was a big revelation for 11-year-old me. Interestingly, despite being made to look more realistic, even accounting for graphics, the women here aren't really hypersexualized like <clears throat> some characters in some other games. Quistis is absolutely amazing. 
Her ability to completely see through Squall from the very beginning is disarming. It's a nice touch where the game sort of pokes fun at itself for playing this very stereotypical stoic main protagonist. Her very presence makes early Squall feel like a better character. Not only that, she is really powerful in the gameplay with her mini blue magic limit breaks, some of which can insta-kill any non-boss combatants. The world itself is filled with secrets and intrigue. Throughout the game, you hear of sorceresses, run across ancient relics, and a huge unexplained crater in the north. There's so much history to this world, and it feels like the game only ever really scratches the surface of it. We get to hear about things like the Sorceress War in Esthar, but where are the sorceresses from? What does the term sorceress mean when anybody trained can use magic spells? We get to hear that the gardens were once refugee shelters and that's why they can move, but refugees from what? We don't really know. What the hell is the lunatic Pandora beyond a monster summoning device? Who created it and why? So much, yet we only get to see the tiniest bit. But that's actually great for world building. It gives us a reason to go scour the continents for secrets, to find crazy powers or GF allies, or find that tiny scrap. It gives us a reason to explore. I know this isn't technically an open world game, it's an overworld with levels built in, but I still feel like this was my first open world experience, since it's so huge and full of mystery. Sorceresses, magic, space stations, hot boys and hot girls, flying fortresses doing battle, time travel. The game has all the action and show-stopping elements, but it also has heart, its seriousness, and humanity. Final Fantasy VIII's story has a lot to offer, and these are the reasons that it stands above the others in my book. So I was editing the audio of this video and I realized that I had completely omitted one of my favorite parts of this game, the side quests. If you've ever played a Final Fantasy game, you know that the story generally has a lull point and you're given somehow a means to travel around the world completing side quests that were previously unavailable. The cool thing about Final Fantasy VIII is that there are actually many points where this happens, when you get the mobile garden up and running throughout Disc 2 and 3, and when you get the Ragnarok ship later in Disc 3 and 4. The garden allows you some freedom, but you still can't access areas that don't have a beach, because it can't fly high enough to scale cliffs, I guess. The Ragnarok fixes this, but I really didn't want to talk about the traversal here, I wanted to talk about the quests themselves. In the Ragnarok, if you fly out into the deep sea on the side of the world where no continents are visible, in the center of this area is a mysterious deep sea research base. When you go in, you are met with a pulsating light and an enigmatic voice telling you to go away. Eventually, you fight the GF behind this voice, which is how you get Bahamut. But this is only the first layer of this mystery. After you reach him, there's this hole where the light used to be, leading further down into the underwater research station. Down there, you're met with a puzzle where you have to use steam power to open doors to get even further down. But there is only so much steam to use up. If you do the puzzle correctly, you get into this final huge chamber. Remember, this is all under the ocean. Yet, there are these ruins here from some unknown civilization. Again, tying into the theme that there's so much history in this world that we're just not privy to. As you descend in this cavern, you're met with increasingly powerful enemies, but the final test is at the bottom. This is Ultima Weapon, the second hardest fight in the game, and the one that I made a guide for when I was just, I think, 12. And it's totally optional, totally missable, unless you either use a guide or just wandered out into the middle of the ocean. Ultima Weapon can instantly wipe a character, and regularly wipes your entire team. Even if you are completely prepared, it is a really challenging fight. However, the reward is worth it. It's the final, ultimate GF, Eden, which is the only GF summon that can do greater than 9,999 damage in a single strike, regularly doing over 30,000. That's just one of the side quests, and there are many others. For example, 
Getting the GF Odin and Toneberry King requires you to find this weird diamond-shaped ruin in the overworld on the Sintra continent. For the former, a timer appears and you must traverse the ruins, defeating the enemies along the way and solving a puzzle involving removable eyes and statues and a single code. For the latter, you're subjected to a grueling test of defeating many Toneberries until the king comes out to face you. But there are many others. Up on the continent of Trabia, you'll meet the Shumi village, which are the same people that Norg came from, and they'll have a quest for you. Or randomly in battles, you'll see a UFO take away the enemy, and eventually you find the crashed UFO and the alien that inhabited it. But the final side quest in the game has to be my favorite, and it really offers no reward outside knowing that you completed it. In Ultimessia's castle, in Disc 4, if you ring a bell in the chapel, you can summon Omega Weapon, which is basically a souped-up, reskinned version of Ultima. Only this dude can wipe your entire party in a single blow if you aren't careful. I adore the challenge that this fight poses, and the real fun, outside of actually beating it, is the preparation that is required, at least for me. The meticulous stat min-maxing, junctioning, weapon upgrading, etc, etc, that all leads to it. It's so amazing, and I honestly can't believe I forgot to talk about this at first, but anyway, moving on. A lot has been said about the draw system in Final Fantasy VIII. I haven't heard or read any of it, but a lot has been said. Personally, I really enjoy it. For those of you who haven't played the game, here's a quick rundown of how it works. Every enemy in the game carries some magic, and there are even spots in the world where magic flows like a spring. Your characters, after equipping a GF, can draw the magic into themselves and either use it or store it. Stored magic can be junctioned, aka assigned to your character's stats like HP, strength, vitality, magic, etc. The stronger the magic and the more of it your character holds, the higher those stats go up when you junction it. There are tons of little nuances to learn with the junctioning system though, such as life-giving magic is better suited to HP, and so in a lot of cases, a stronger attack spell will be less effective than a somewhat weaker healing spell. Oh, the reverse is true for strength, though. All the other stats have this same proclivity towards certain types of spells. Not only that, but junctions can also be made to increase your elemental attack and defense. Ditto for status effects. You can carry a hundred of each spell you hold, though you can't carry all spells at all times. This always leads to me, every time I play the game, drawing 100 of nearly every early spell I can get my hands on to level up my characters. And though the process of drawing all the needed magic can be somewhat grueling, I can't really fault the game for it since it was my choice to do so, and nothing in the game really encouraged me or nudges me to do it outside the desire to become as strong as possible. Drawing and junctioning magic effectively can make any character a powerhouse, absorbing nearly all elemental damage or having super high attack stats or whatever. For this reason, there really aren't normal Final Fantasy archetypes in 8. Any character can fill any role given the right junctions and magic equipped. I think this freedom is what makes creating your team so rewarding, even if during the end game, it comes down to just junctioning the strongest types of magic for everyone. The process of getting to that point takes effort and is well rewarded. Weapons are leveled up in a way which may seem familiar now, but was not normal at the time for Final Fantasy. Just as all monsters carry magic, they also carry items, which can be used to craft upgrades for your weapons. Normally, you get the recipes for these upgrades through reading magazines in the game, but they're not required. You can upgrade a weapon as soon as you get the right ingredients. This allows for crazy amounts of freedom not seen in other games, such as being able to craft Squall's ultimate weapon, Lionheart, in Disc 1. This is absolutely unheard of in any of the other mainline Final Fantasy games I've played. And holy crap, is Squall's weapon cool. Impractical though it may be, a gun attached to a sword, or a sword attached to a gun, whichever way you slice it, is awesome. 
There's even a gameplay element to using it. During a normal attack right before Squall hits the enemy, pressing R1 fires the gun and significantly increases the damage. It's such a simple thing, but that added to the active time battle version of the normal turn-based combat can make fights a lot more intense. And when Squall's health gets low or the aura spell is cast, he goes into his limit break, which requires the player to again pull the trigger on the gunblade for every hit he performs. It's not just the gameplay though, just look at these fucking limit breaks. God damn I love this game. Each character has their own unique limit break too, and all but one of them are really awesome. For Irvine, you get to fire his gun, choosing different types of ammo. Some of them are explosive, some of them are energy rounds, etc. Zell's is basically like a mini fighting game, requiring button combinations to perform certain moves. We've already talked about Quistus's blue magic, but Renoa uses her arm as a cannon and fires her dog like a missile, which is fucking genius. Only Selfie's ability is boring, and yet it's one of the most powerful. It's basically just a slot machine that you keep on refreshing, and it can cast different magics, some of which are really powerful and completely unique to her. So I had to put in a little section here to showcase some of the GF summons in this game because, wow, they are absolutely stunning. There isn't a single weak one in the bunch. Ifrit rides a giant flaming meteor high in the air and then does a back-breaking move to punch it back down on the enemy. The brothers play a game of rock, paper, scissors to see which one gets launched up at the enemy with the loser sobbing as he's flying up. Shiva. Oh, Shiva. She made me feel some feelings as a young 11-year-old. She shoots up from the ground in this icicle, breaks it apart, and sends shards hurtling at the enemy. Bahamut, a mainstay in the Final Fantasy series, is an awesome dark dragon shown flying just under the clouds, barely peeking through, and then unleashes his ultimate mega flare down on the enemy. They're just so well animated and done with such clear love for these characters that it's a joy to summon them every time. But there's a lot more to the GF than just their summon attacks though. Each one learns different types of abilities, and when junction to a character allows the character to use said abilities. Certain abilities are unique to certain GFs, which can be used to make the character they're junction to even more like a certain archetype, like an attack or defense, mage or healer, whatever. There's more to it even than that, but I'll leave it there for now. Did you think that I'd talk about 8 without bringing up the OG card minigame? Triple Triad was Gwent before Gwent was a twinkle in the eyes of CD Projekt. I have spent at least as much time playing this card game as I have playing the entire rest of the game because it's just so fucking genius. And it's even integrated into the main game in some really cool ways. So basic rundown of the game. You start with a board with nine spaces for cards to be placed. Each player takes a turn laying a card down. The cards have four numbers on them, one for each side. If you lay a card next to an opponent's card and your card has a higher number on the sides that touch, then their card is flipped and is now considered yours. Do this until nine spaces are filled and whoever has the most cards on the board wins. Pretty simple, right? Well, there are a ton of confounding factors. Each region in the game has its own unique rule sets, like some cards will have elements and some spaces have elements too. Placing a card in that space with a matching element adds to the numbers on the card, or if it's not, it detracts from them. Other regions use the same rule, which will flip multiple cards if you match those touching numbers exactly. Some regions allow the winner to take one card from the loser, others allow you to take all of them. Stuff like that. Not only that, but since each region is different, and as you travel between them, you take the rules you learned with you, then you mix them together with the region you're visiting. It just gets delightfully complex, and it is 
hopelessly addicting. As I said, there are benefits to playing the game outside of winning cards. The GF Quetzalcoatl has two abilities, card and card mod. The first allows you to turn any non-boss enemy into a card, and the second, even better ability, allows you to transform cards into useful items. And when I say useful, I really mean it. Some of these items can only be obtained through cards. Either that, or they have rare drop rates when battling monsters, so card mod is the most effective way of getting them. You can mod cards into all kinds of items, from ones that can be used to refine into spells, to others that will teach your GFs really powerful abilities, to others that can be used straight up in upgrading your weapons. It's probably the single most useful ability in the game, and it makes playing Triple Triad all the more rewarding. The music in this game plays in my dreams, in my random thoughts throughout the day. It's been 20 years since I first heard the soundtrack, and it's still stuck in my head. I've been playing it in the background of this video, so maybe it'll be stuck in yours now too. I've heard the remastered versions of these songs, and while they're good, there's this charm to the heavily compressed, synthesized versions from the original kind of in the same way that 8-bit music has its own charm, leading musicians to create new works in that genre. The card game tune and the battle music especially slap, and give an awesome added layer of tension to these moments. The slower songs, like the one you can hear in the concert on disc 2, are heart-wrenching, even with Kenny G style. No, because of Kenny G styled synthesized saxophone. And then there is the absolutely haunting song, Liberi Fatali, a Latin choral piece that adds a real sense of dread in the confrontations with the sorceresses. You hear this in the intro of the game as well. I'll often hear these songs in other YouTubers' videos, and yet nobody really talks about where they're from. Nobuo Oometsu, I'm really sorry if I mispronounced that name, but he absolutely knocked it out of the park with this soundtrack, and I wanted to take the time to thank him for it. I think he said it best when describing the music or the motivation behind creating it. He said, I think it will be a shame if we won't be able to cry as we play our own game. If you know me outside of YouTube, you know that I've suffered with depression for many years. If you don't, then you don't. This is the first time I've talked about it on the channel. I recently took a short break from producing videos to focus more on my mental health and to look for a job as I left my PhD program. For some reason though, when I'm feeling especially down, I tend to gravitate toward this game, hence why I've played it so many times, and started without finishing even more. Make no mistake, I don't want to claim that depression is curable by a video game. It's a medical condition, a chemical imbalance in the brain that needs medicine to treat. Yet hearing that opening tune or starting up a game of Triple Triad is like an instant shot of dopamine to my brain, and so I will be forever grateful to the minds at Square Enix for making it. It may not be a cure, but it's definitely a comfort, one that I keep going back to time and time again for the gameplay. The classic bombastic story, the timeless music, or the whole thing which to me is greater than the sum of its parts. So after all of that, would I recommend someone play this game? Well, maybe. There's a remastered version on Steam for PC and mobile. It has slightly improved graphics and is in HD, as you can see here, and it has some decent features, but for my money, the original is best. Granted, I have nostalgia glasses, so the graphics don't look quite as bad to me. All the emulator apps allow you to map special buttons like fast forwarding the game, which are priceless when playing it through some of the old grindier bits. Definitely give it a try if you haven't played it. If you can get past the outdated look, there's a lot to like, and a lot of love put into the world by its creators. So thank you for watching my video. I really appreciate that I'm able to do these and more thankful that people actually like to watch them. That's absolutely wild to me in a way I don't think I could ever accurately express. To my patrons especially, who waited patiently for whatever came next, thank you. 
for your support and for all the kind messages when I told you I needed to take a break. And I have some good news as well. I got a job as a professional tutor for physics and math, which is really awesome. It should allow me more freedom to continue producing content like this. And my ultimate goal, as you may know if you've watched these ending notes before, is to make this a full-time job. I love getting to be creative, talking about things I'm passionate about. So if you enjoy these videos and would like to help support me in that endeavor, please consider becoming a patron. I think that's all for now. Thank you, and I'll see you next time.